Um, and Jeff, feel free to stay on if, if you have a few minutes to listen to. I'll, I'll have to go. So Are you here, let, let me say thank you to all of you. I and have not uh, met Gabriel yet. So this is, I've communicated with him. Uh, Gabriel is a, an associate professor at Berkeley. Please come on up, uh, Gabriel, uh, who has uh, done incredible work documenting how we can quantify where the rich hide their money. It is a transformative opus of work that opens the way to, uh, dare I say, tax that wealth, is it that, perhaps? Um, and uh, he is uh, been, uh, thus part of an extraordinary team at UC Berkeley looking at inequity issues and how to remedy them. We are thrilled that he is coming here today, not far from his home base, to talk with us. Nice to meet you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so financing Medicare for all. So the starting point is there is a consensus that everybody should have access to health care. Um, what does that mean? You know, let's let's try to see to think about the funding equation here. Um, U.S. health care costs, as we know, are record high. The U.S. spends 20% of its national income in healthcare. That's $15,000 per year on average per adult. That's really important to understand. On average, the U.S. spends today $15,000 a year per adult. Uh, the U.S., as we know, spends much more than other wealthy nations, but even in Europe, even in Japan, even in Canada, healthcare on the cheap just doesn't exist. There's no cheap way to treat cancer. There's no cheap way to uh, treat uh, heart diseases. So all countries, even those that try hard to control costs, spend at least 10% of their national income on health. Um, 10% that would still be $7,500 per adult on average in the US. That would still be a lot. And that means that a full private funding of healthcare is not possible. Just to fix ideas, today the average income for half of the US population, for the bottom 50% of the income distribution, is $18,500 per adult a year. So half of the US population lives with an average pre-tax income of $18,500. It's not possible to pay $15, $15,000 for healthcare. It's not possible to even pay $7,500 for healthcare. That's why there's a need for public funding. And there's a lot of public funding already with Medicaid, with Medicare, uh, with Affordable Care Act subsidies, but none of that alleviates the cost of health care for uh, working families, for workers who have to fund their health care through private insurance premiums. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the funding situation for the more than 100 million Americans who have to uh, fund health care uh, by getting private health insurance, mostly through their employers, and how unfair that system is, and uh, how it could be replaced by uh, something more sustainable. The way this works today is that uh, health insurance for uh, workers is funded through what you could call a huge privatized poll tax. So let me explain. Both employers and employees and employee paid insurance premiums reduce wages for workers. They are like a tax because they are mandatory. Any uh, employer with more than 50 workers has to offer insurance to their workers. That insurance, these insurance premiums, whether they're nominally paid by employers or nominally paid by employees, they have the same effect. They reduce the, the wage, the take-home pay of covered workers. Second, 
these premiums are like a poll tax or a head tax because they're essentially a fixed amount per head. The secretary literally pays the same as the executive, roughly an average $13,000 per covered worker. Third, it's a privatized tax because it's not you know, paid to the government, it's uh, managed by employers on behalf of the government. M government says, look, it's compulsory to be insured, but employers are going to collect the premiums, are going to remit those premiums to private health insurance companies. It's like a tax, but it's a private tax. And it's crushing because this tax is growing very fast. Private health insurance premiums now amount to 7% of national income. That's about 10% of labor compensation in the US. So let me illustrate the magnitude of that private tax. This is a graph that shows uh, how much taxes the various groups of the population pay today as a fraction of their income. So on the x-axis, you have the various income groups. P0, P10 is the bottom 10% of the income distribution. So the 10% of Americans with the lowest incomes. And P10, 20 is the next 10%. And then it zooms on the right, you know, up, up uh, all the way to the top 400 richest Americans. Um, and so then you see the various taxes, so consumption taxes, sales taxes essentially are very big as a fraction of income for uh, uh, poor Americans, for low income Americans. Payroll taxes are very big and small at the top because they're capped. The individual income tax, you know, is uh, not a big tax for the working class and middle class, but it's more sizable at the top. And then you see the blue area is adding to these regular you know, public taxes, consumption taxes, power taxes, individual income taxes, adding now these private you know, poll or head insurance tax. And it is huge you know, for the middle class, what the middle class pays in private health insurance premiums directly or through their employers, that's more than 10% of their income. That's more than what they pay in individual income taxes. That's more than what they pay in payroll taxes. That's the biggest tax of them all. And it's hugely regressive because since it's a fixed amount per head for the wealthy on the right hand side, it's essentially nothing, 0% of their income. So that's the current situation. How do we get, uh, how do we fix this mess? Uh, the solution involves replacing these private insurance premiums by taxes based on ability to pay that is based on your income maybe your wealth and there are tons of ways to do that but the very important the most important thing to understand is that no matter how you do this exactly no matter how you replace private health insurance premiums by taxes since the current premiums are so regressive are so unfair if you replace those by taxes that are proportional to income, or maybe more than proportional to income, progressive, higher rates when your income rises, this would lead to a huge reduction in costs for the vast majority of working families. So let me give you know, one simple way to uh, a transition to Medicare for all funding is uh, you know, scrap all private insurance premiums and replace those by, let's say, broad-based uh, uh, tax proportional to income on all income sources, on all labor compensation and profits collected by employers. You know, so you could have a tax at the rate of 6% on all labor costs, all profits, and that would be enough to replace all private insurance premiums. That's a huge, if you want, flat tax that would be much more fair, much more progressive than the current insurance premiums. You can do more than that. You know, you can have, instead of a 6% rate, you can have 4% and uh, add progressive income taxes or maybe a progressive wealth tax or maybe a higher corporate income tax rate. No matter how you do that exactly, if you do this, this would lead to the biggest take-home pay increase in a generation for working families. So that's really the most important point and that's what I want you to understand. Let me give you an illustration and let me make you know, concretely very clear how this would work. Imagine Medicare for all passes, 
becomes law. How do we transition to a fairer funding model? How do we fund Medicare for all? In year one, you would have a law, you could have a law uh, that would mandate the conversion of private insurance premiums, both paid by workers and employers into wages. In year one, there's a law that says, if your employer last year contributed $10,000 to an insurance company on your behalf, now instead of paying $10,000 to the insurance company, they have to increase your wage by $10,000, okay? For employers, look, notice that for employers, this is neutral. It changes nothing. Instead of paying $10,000 to private health insurance companies, they increase your wage by $10,000. Nothing changes. Year two, or you could do in year one at the same time, but you know, maybe it's simpler if you do it in year two. The government introduces new taxes. It can be a broad-based uh, income tax that I described, it can be a progressive income tax, it can be a, a wealth tax. Let me illustrate how things would change if the government introduces a flat 6% tax. Let me take the case of a worker who today has a wage of $40,000 and pays directly and through her employer $12,000 in health insurance premiums. For that worker, her true labor compensation today is $52,000, but $12,000 are eaten by healthcare, go directly to health insurance companies. In year one, the wage of that worker would rise from $40,000 to $52,000. In year two, there's this 6% tax that's introduced, 6% of $52,000, that's uh, $4,200, so the net wage, net of that tax, would fall to $47,800. Notice that this is still $7,800 more than the current wage of that person. So all included, this is a 20% net pay increase. This would be the biggest, again, the biggest pay raise in 40 years for tens of millions for close to 100 million working families in the US. And, you know, that's enough to fund Medicare for all. That's all it takes. You know, you can, if you have more aggressive cost cutting, you can have a lower tax than 6%. Okay, but essentially that's all you need. And of course, if you do a, a fixed uh, a flat tax, you know, 6% on all income, 90% of Americans win from that because today they have to pay these fixed premiums who are huge as a fraction of income for the bottom 90% of the, of the population. Uh, and they would have to pay these uh, taxes based on income that would be less than the current premiums. But for the top 5% uh, richer Americans, uh, their you know, uh, 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 taxes uh, would have to uh, increase uh, a little bit. That is what this graph uh, illustrates. But the basic point, and what I wanted to emphasize, is if you do this very simple fix, you replace insurance premiums with, with that are fixed amounts per head today by taxes based on ability to pay, no matter how exactly you do this, you ensure that you can make sure that more than 90%, maybe up to 95% of Americans benefit from such a, a, a change uh, in funding and for tens of millions of Americans, that's the biggest take home pay increase in a generation. Thank you very much. Question. 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 No, no, no. Questions. 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 Right here. So um, two questions. One, where would the money come in the first year for the um, 
for the system. And two, why not do it both at the same time? Because people don't like you give them something and then you take it away, even if they end up with $7,800 more. Yeah, the, these are very important questions. So in year, in, if you do you know, the transition in year one and new taxes in year two, obviously you have a deficit, government deficit in year one, which is a very temporary government deficit. You would have a deficit, you know, you increase the deficit by maybe four points of GDP in, in one year, okay? And, you know, it's not a big deal because it's temporary. Everybody knows that this is just in, in year one. The, the, the advantage of, of, of doing things uh, this way where you convert premiums in year one and then you add, you introduce taxes in year two is that it makes things really clear. You know, everybody understand in year one, look, I, I used to be paid $40,000, but in fact, my true wage was $52,000. 12,000 used to go to health insurance companies. That was eating my paycheck. And now finally, I get back what I used to pay to these private health insurance companies. It makes things really clean, very clear. It's easy to monitor that employers increase increase the wages of their workers one for one. It's important to have a law and to, to think about the, the enforcing mechanism. You want to make sure that employers don't pocket the, the, the difference and that they don't pocket uh, the, 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 the health insurance premiums. And doing things that way makes it very simple to monitor that there is indeed this full conversion of all premiums, employee and employers, uh, into wages. Um, but look, I have no problem with uh, doing both things at the same time, the mandatory conversion and introducing the new taxes. You know, it's, it's, in the end, it's a political decision. Uh, economically, it makes no difference, essentially. Um, does it, is it really neutral for employers if they raise wages, doesn't the payroll tax increase? So what's, what's neutral for employers, employers today pay a lot in health insurance premiums to private health insurance companies. So if today your employer contributes $10,000 on your behalf, to a private insurance company, it's neutral if instead of paying 10K to a private health insurance company, they increase your wage by $10,000. For them, it changes nothing. The labor cost is the same. Or to put it differently, today the true labor cost for an employer of someone who, whose wage is $40,000, but uh, whose health care costs $10,000, the true labor cost for employers is $50,000. They pay $50,000 to employ that person. 10,000 goes to health insurance companies, only $40,000 goes on that person's bank account. Removing the 10K payments, increasing wages by the same amount is fully neutral for employers. And I think employers, you know, they would like a system like that. Because right now, they have to spend, you know, they have to administer this private poll tax. They collect, the, you know, they, they remit the premiums to insurance companies. It's costly for them. In the system that I described, employers wouldn't have any more to care about health care. That would be done by the government. It's not, it's not only that this would be neutral for employers. It would actually be a net gain for employers. Would this work for the um, small business owner or a private practice physician who may have five employees? And how would it work for someone new that you hired who didn't have a history of having health insurance with you the year before, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. So it all depends, you know, for private businesses, if they were covering their workers already, uh, same thing, you know, mandatory conversion of uh, premiums into wages. If they were not covering their workers, 
uh, in that case, what happens is the workers uh, in year two, in effect, would have to pay a bit more in taxes, depending on you know, what taxes fund Medicare for all. But on the plus side, they gain health insurance. So today, these workers were not covered. And in, in a system like the one that I described, in year two, maybe their taxes go up a little bit, but now they have coverage. You can imagine uh, to collect taxes in such a way that nobody would have to pay more in taxes, that there would be exemptions for uh, low-income workers uh, uh, or that people who used to pay no, uh, uh, um, who used to be not covered uh, in the previous system wouldn't have to pay uh, new taxes so that absolutely everybody, at least in the bottom 90% or the, or the bottom 95% of the income distribution, uh, gains in monetary terms from the transition to Medicare for all, but you don't even have, you know, to do that. You could do that if you want to do that. That's totally doable. Yeah. Hi, uh, a lot of the initiative for uh, Medicare for all was coming from, uh, from the states. And have you worked out how uh, this could be done on, rather than a national program on a state basis like California yeah. or Oregon? Yeah, so that's really important. Yes, this can be done at the state level. Uh, a state like California could absolutely do that, could say, look, uh, if you are employed in California, we're going to collect new taxes on, on employers, like the 6% national income tax, or we're going to increase the, the your income tax, or we're going to introduce a wealth tax, or we're going to do that at the same time to fund Medicare for all uh, for California. So this can be done uh, at the state level. Uh, my guess is uh, if the federal government fails to act uh, past uh, 2021, I think it's, it's plausible, it's, it's possible that we'll see initiatives like that uh, at the state level and, and possibly in, in a state like California. Uh, it's the next administration that we have to start. Yes. So I, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to um, continue on to the next panel because we're already behind. So a big round of applause for Gabriel. So as uh, you know, I'm going to talk about the European experience with private health insurance today. European health systems uh, rely very heavily on public financing to cover the whole population usually, but they all allow some people to buy private health insurance, what I'm going to call voluntary health insurance or VHI, in addition to their public entitlement. So people are publicly covered, compulsorily covered by the government, but some people can buy voluntary health insurance on top if they want to. And one of the key lessons from the European experience is that voluntary health insurance is not an easy ride. It's really hard work for government. And I want to illustrate this today using two examples from France and Ireland. So this chart shows you how public spending on health dominates in all of the countries of the European Union. And that's the green bit of this chart. So public spending on health is really the dominant source of funding. But it doesn't account for more than 85% of total spending on health in any of the countries in the EU. And this leaves a gap in coverage, in publicly financed coverage. And in many countries, in all countries, this means that there are out-of-pocket payments for healthcare, which is the red bit of each of the charts. And then there is also a role for voluntary health insurance spending. And you can see that's the yellow bit of these charts that spending through voluntary health insurance is really small in most European countries. So public spending dominates, there are out-of-pocket payments, and then there's a small role for voluntary health insurance. And if we think of out-of-pocket payments, the red bit of this chart as being the gaps in coverage, you can also see that in most countries, voluntary health insurance does not really do a good job of filling these gaps in publicly financed coverage. So it's not always effective. Voluntary health insurance plays really different roles in different countries. And this is because it responds to differences in gaps in publicly financed coverage. 
I learned yesterday that it's very important not to use labels to talk about this, so I will just describe the different roles that it can play. Uh, in, in most countries, the most common form of voluntary health insurance offers people uh, more choice of provider and faster access to treatment, particularly where there are long waiting times for publicly financed health services. This is the most common form. These types of markets are usually small, you can see on this side here, but there's one large market that, that is really outstanding um, or exceptional, an outlier, and that's Ireland. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Voluntary health insurance can also cover uh, user fees, cost sharing, co-payments, co-insurance, deductibles, and so on. And this is the role that it plays in France. Alternatively, it can cover services that are, not ex that are they're excluded from the publicly financed benefits package. Most countries have some kind of very small market for this type of voluntary health insurance. Um, but it tends to cover things like dental care or physiotherapy. And one of the, the lessons from Europe is that countries find voluntary health insurance to be a very challenging policy instrument. Um, and there are two main reasons for this. One is that where you have voluntary health insurance, it systematically favors better off people, richer people, more educated people, people living in cities who have access to private providers. And because of this, it tends to exacerbate inequalities in access to health services. But it can also undermine publicly financed coverage in other ways. And it does this where it's large by drawing public resources, not just financial resources, but sometimes human resources too, staff, people, drawing those resources away from need. So skewing the allocation of public resources away from need for health care. And I want to illustrate how this might happen using the examples of France and Ireland. So France first. France is really unusual in uh, having a, a relatively high level of public spending on health, but explicitly deciding to limit that public spending um, and allowing people to uh, filling the gap through co-payments, through user charges, but at the same time encouraging people to buy private insurance, voluntary health insurance, to cover their co-payments. Um, it's unusual because it's achieved really high take up of voluntary health insurance. Around 90%, 95% of the population has additional voluntary health insurance to cover their co-payments on top of their publicly financed entitlement. And the high take, take up reflects a number of factors. First of all, really heavy co-payments in the form of co-insurance. So co-insurance across the board for all health services, including inpatient care. So there's a push factor. People feel there's a risk for them, a financial risk, and they really need to have the voluntary health insurance in addition. It's partly also habit. The market is, the voluntary health insurance market is really long established in France. It goes back for decades. And about half of the people with voluntary health insurance have it through their employment. But it also reflects really hard work on the part of the government through regulating the market, providing very poor households with free access to voluntary health insurance. About 5% of the population has free uh, access to private health insurance. And um, subsidizing, heavily subsidizing voluntary health insurance for people who are, who are poor. So free for the very poor, subsidized for the poor. In 2016, the government also made it mandatory for employers to partially finance voluntary health insurance for their employees. So really extensive intervention by the government in this market explains why it's so high in terms of take up. But problems persist. There are still inequalities in access to health services between those who have bought their own voluntary health insurance, those who have free health insurance, and those who still don't have health insurance at all inequalities in the use of health services. And it's also very regressive and unequitable in terms of financing healthcare. And that's what this chart is showing you, that although out-of-pocket payments are now in France relatively evenly distributed across households, the burden of paying for voluntary health insurance premiums is really unequally distributed and a much higher financial burden for the poor than for the richest in society. So a few lessons from the French experience. First of all, it shows very clearly that the poorest people, the most vulnerable people, are the most difficult to reach with any kind of health insurance coverage. And even though France makes all this effort and it exclusively targets its tax subsidies towards the poorest households, this hasn't been enough. 
And partly that's because people have to apply for this benefit. If you want to get the free voluntary health insurance or the subsidized voluntary health insurance, you have to fill in forms and there's a bureaucratic process. And this clearly is an obstacle um, to access for some people. So the second lesson is that where you have entitlements, where you try and protect people, where you extend coverage, it's really important for this entitlement to be automatic. And that goes not just for voluntary health insurance, but for public, publicly financed systems too. And then the third and the most important lesson is that it's probably best to avoid making healthcare unaffordable through user fees in the first place. So when you're thinking about the design of your single payer system here, either go for no co-payments at all, or think very carefully about how you might design co-payments in a way that is not going to, to pose a financial burden for, for poor people, or for anybody, in fact. Ireland uh, has a very different type of voluntary health insurance market. It covers around half of the population, and people buy it to have more choice of provider, access to private hospitals, um, and also faster treatment to, to be able to jump waiting times in the public sector. But the result of this is that really, because the market is so large, covering 50% of the population, it really skews public resources away from need. So initially, the richer people in Ireland were not entitled to um, full coverage of inpatient care. So they had to buy voluntary health insurance to cover their inpatient care costs. Because of this, because the government wasn't paying so much for them, it felt it was reasonable to offer tax subsidies to these people to encourage them to take up voluntary health insurance. But the government also decided that voluntary health insurance finance patients could be treated in public hospitals through public uh, specialist physicians, but that it wouldn't charge voluntary health insurance companies the full economic cost of using those public beds. It also said that Physicians working in public hospitals could, could charge higher fees to privately uh, insured patients, creating a clear incentive for doctors to prioritize these patients. And not surprisingly, a demand for voluntary health insurance finance treatment in public hospitals grew, and as a result, waiting times in public hospitals also expanded. At this point, people who are not rich suddenly think, help, I need to buy voluntary health insurance too in order to, to have faster access to treatment. I don't want to be stuck with a long waiting time. So the non-rich also start to buy private health insurance, exacerbating the problem of long waits in public hospitals. Then the government decides there is such a problem with waiting times in the public system that it's actually going to buy treatment from private hospitals. So public money being used to finance private care for publicly financed patients. Um, and then to top it all, the government decides that if you're not young when you buy voluntary health insurance, you're going to be penalized. It creates a very strong financial incentive for more people, particularly young people, to take up voluntary health insurance. And so the vicious circle continues. Now, on the face of it, this, this, the government policy in Ireland seems uh, really nonsensical. It seems that the, the public policy was, was weak indiscriminate tax subsidies, benefiting richer people much more than poorer people, failing to have very clear boundaries between public and private provision. But I think it also illustrates how difficult it was for the government to act in a rational manner when faced with a combination of very powerful interests. And it wasn't just the private insurance companies that had a stake in this, but the richer people who were benefiting from having voluntary health insurance and the providers who also benefited a lot from this system. So the interests were very difficult for the government to, to work against. Now the government of Ireland is reforming this system. They have finally realized that this kind of market has really detrimental effects when it is large, and they're going for something that is small. Small is, is beautiful or at least less ugly than the current system. So my concluding slide, I begin, um, I finish where I began by saying that voluntary health insurance is really hard work for government. Countries in Europe encourage voluntary health insurance um, in some cases because it can relieve fis fiscal pressure for governments. But it also comes with costs, and I think that's very clear from these two examples here. That said, many of the challenges associated with voluntary health insurance can be anticipated, they're predictable, you can see them coming. 
Economic theory tells us that in a voluntary market, insurers are going to behave in a risk-averse way, and that means that there will be problems of access and affordability for voluntary health insurance. We've also seen from international experience that public policy is often weak and doesn't direct and regulate the market in the way that it should. Poor design, failure to monitor the market, failure to manage interests, and all of these have an impact. But the context uh, also really matters. And I think that for many of the European markets, voluntary health insurance was established at a time when health insurance generally was, was much less established. What I understand today in the context of the United States is that you have a very mature, very sophisticated health insurance market. And I think that the implication for the US of that fact is that these challenges in the US are going to be even, even greater than they are in many European countries and that the work for government is going to be even harder. Thank you. Now we're going to move to Danielle. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Sarah. Well, thanks so much. Thank you, Jim, for inviting me to join all of you today. Um, I will begin with the same caveat I always start with whenever I'm presenting in the US, which is that I am not here to be an apologist for the many challenges and weaknesses and warts of the Canadian healthcare system, nor to proselytize its perfection to any of you. I am only here to give you some perspective about where I think there might be lessons that you could draw in your own efforts uh, to improve healthcare here, uh, where we call south of the border. Um, and my, I'll bring my perspective as a, as a practicing clinician and as a hospital administrator as well as an academic. So I'm really just going to try to answer the question that I was asked, which is how does private health insurance or voluntary health insurance, uh, as my colleagues call it, how does it work in Canada and what are the lessons for you here in the United States? So uh, this table is drawn from a, a special issue of The Lancet that came out in 2018 about the Canadian healthcare system. And I'm going to walk you through it because it really tells you all you need to know. Uh, in Canada, we have coverage that is very well known internationally for being what we call narrow but deep. And you will see in what I, I call here layer one that for hospital, for medically necessary hospital and physician services in the Canadian healthcare systems, and our systems are run at the uh, provincial and territorial or the equivalent of your state level uh, in our country, we have um, effectively a single payer, single tier system for which there is only public insurance. It is not possible to purchase private insurance it is not possible to pay out of pocket to get faster access to services that are covered in layer one, which means anything medically necessary provided by a doctor or in a hospital, period. But that doesn't mean that we don't have private health insurance in Canada because layers two and three have lots of private payment and voluntary insurance involved. In layer two, there is a mix of public and private Funding and layer two will look quite familiar to you, or it should, because it functions a lot um, in the same ways that your healthcare systems here in the United States function. We have some public coverage, some public coverage, for example, for seniors, some public coverage, for example, for people who are uh, living in poverty or have disabilities. For people who are employed, there is private coverage and many people are still paying out of pocket. And the biggest areas where this is relevant, and uh, you heard Adam Gaffney speak about this briefly in his talk, um, is with respect to prescription drugs, dental, long-term care, and mental health care when not provided by a physician. Remember I said doctor and hospital services are covered in the public plans, but if you're seeing a psychologist for cognitive behavioral therapy or a social worker or what have you, then those services fall into layer two, and you will either be having public coverage because you fall into one of those vulnerable groups, or you have coverage through your employer, or you may have no coverage and be paying out of pocket. And then the final layer of services, layer three, are those where people are mostly paying out of pocket or through private insurance uh, that they purchase for themselves or more often through their employers. And that's for things like dental, vision, et cetera. So does Canada have Medicare for all? 
Yes, absolutely we do, of the kind that you've heard described and um, aspired to throughout the day today, but we have it for doctors and hospitals. It is a sick 1960s designed system that has not evolved to represent the comprehensive health needs of our population. And those of us who are continuing to push for improvements and reform in Canada are looking to see how much can we push up services that are falling into layers two and three into that Medicare for all layer at the top. So how does private health insurance or voluntary health insurance work in Canada? Well, 70% of our spending of every health dollar that's spent in Canada is spent pu publicly and 30 cents is spent privately, but as I've just described, in contrast to most of the other European and OECD nations that we've been talking about today, in Canada, that 70% is heavily focused on physicians and hospitals. So we have no co-payments, we have no deductibles, we have no co-insurance of any kind for those services, a heavy concentration in those doctor and hospital realms to the exclusion, and that 30% gets pushed out primarily into private insurance and private pay for things like prescription medications, et cetera. Which with the result that two thirds of Canadians actually do have voluntary health insurance. But again, that health insurance only covers those things that are not covered by what we call Medicare in Canada. And most of that uh, private payment is through private insurance that's provided by employers in organizations. So as in every system, when you introduce voluntary or private health insurance, some people get left out. These uh, graphics speak to who those people are. And in Ontario, my province, uh, with the largest uh, proportion of the population in the country, we currently have 1.5 million working people who do not have any coverage for prescription medications outside of hospital. Remember we said if you're admitted to the hospital, you never see a bill, you can have an MRI, you can have an operation, you can have an ICU stay, you can have you know, uh, IV amphotericin and anything that you could need and every pill that you could possibly require will be given to you free of charge and you will not see a bill. But when you come to see me in my office as a family doctor and I see you and I diagnose you and I send you for an X-ray or an ultrasound or a surgical consultation, all of that is covered and then I hand you a prescription and you walk out onto the sidewalk and you are on your own. And that has a very important impact on the health of Canadians and has led to the data that you've already seen regarding high rates of, non, of cost related non adherence to prescription medicines in Canada. And of course, a differential impact on women, on young workers, and on racialized workers or what you call people of color here. So how does it work and how do we regulate it? And this is an old chart that has uh, since had a few updates to it, but the fundamental realities of this chart remain the same. Is private insurance illegal in those areas where we have public insurance in Canada? In most parts of the country, it's actually not. It, there's just no market for it. And the reason that there is no market for it is because we do not allow doctors to bill patients more than the public plan would reimburse them for those publicly insured services. And we do not allow doctors to bill both publicly and privately. In other words, and I think this is a very um, important thing to try to communicate to an audience in a country where, as I mentioned to some colleagues yesterday, you see everything through the lens of insurance. Everything is about insurance in the American healthcare reform conversation, but actually there are many very important public policy and regulatory protections of a publicly funded healthcare system that, are, that have nothing to do with insurance at all. They have to do with how you regulate what physicians in particular can and cannot do and can and cannot bill for and at what rates. And so as you can see, if you look across this chart, which looks at all 10 Canadian provinces, the territory, our three territories are not included in this particular graphic, you can see that there are bans on private insurance in some Canadian jurisdictions, but not all. And yet there is no market for private insurance because we make it sufficiently unattractive by regulating the price that can be charged. And therefore, uh, we limit the market for it. So, What's the, what's the outcome? Well, we uh, heard a, a comment earlier today about wait times for elective care in Canada. I, I always preface any conversation about wait times in Canada by respectfully reminding you that outcomes of care in Canada across a very wide range of acute and chronic diagnoses are as good or better 
in Canada as they are in the US on, on a population level. And so overall, when Canadians get sick, they get very well taken care of in our system. However, we have a very significant problem with wait times for elective care in some jurisdictions and for some issues, none of which, in my opinion, has anything to do with how much we spend or how we spend it, all of which has to do with the way that we organize our, our system. But that has given rise to a court challenge, a constitutional challenge in, that's uh, it, currently in the, in the courts in British Columbia in which some American colleagues that, who are in this room today have participated in as experts. And uh, this, the essence of this challenge is a challenge on the, uh, the fundamental tenets of the public system in Canada, uh, such that if the plaintiff, uh, the plaintiffs who are nominally patients, but actually is this uh, surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon in British Columbia, Dr. Brian Day, who's trying to overturn the protections on the basis that he believes our healthcare um, provisions to be non-constitutional, non this would overturn not just the ban on private insurance. It would overturn the ban on private duplicative insurance, but it would also very importantly overturn the ban on what we call extra billing, the ban on user fees, and the ban on dual practice. So I just want to say a couple of things about that. If you come to see a physician in Canada for a medically necessary service, it is not legal and, and that physician sends a bill to the, to the public insurance plan. And let's say the public insurance plan reimburses that person 50 bucks for their service. But they feel they're a really great doctor. And their service is really worth 75. It is not permissible for that person to bill the public plan the $50 and then bill you the additional 25. The fee is $50. It's negotiated between the medical association and the government. It's set at a level that is believed to be fair in a, in a transparent collective bargaining process, and that's the fee. Well, what is the incentive then for a physician to um, opt out of the plan and bill you directly for the service if they're not going to make a penny more? You know who pays on time every month? The government insurance plan. The patient not, not perhaps quite as reliable, um, uh, and, and therefore uh, there's very little incentive for a physician to bill the patient directly. The second thing is, should the physician which wish to opt out of the plan and bill the patient directly, knowing they will only get $50 for that service still, but feeling on point of principle that the patient should pay and the patient will then be reimbursed by the public insurance plan, then the physician must opt out entirely and cannot participate in the public plan at all. And again, therefore, making it very unattractive for people who want to have a, a, a direct line to a, a solid, you know, reliable source of, of wages, um, very, very unattractive for physicians to opt out. And so the number of opted out physicians in Canada is very small, not because private insurance is illegal, but because there's no more money to be made in the private sector uh, than in the public sector. So in closing, then, I have three observations uh, to share with you, one from each layer. The first I've just outlined. One of the important lessons for Can from Canada for you to consider with respect to private um, health insurance is that prohibitions on, an, on private health insurance are not the only way to limit its use. They may be an important way in your context, um, particularly given the transition that you may face in a Medicare for All universe, but rules governing extra billing, dual practice, and self-referral are at least as important, at least they are in our context to think about. Let's talk a little bit about considerations from layer two. This is the layer in which, uh, uh, for example, for prescription medications, some people have public coverage and some people have private coverage. And you've just heard very eloquently from Sarah Thompson about how much this can be a, a real problem. Even when you ban or don't you know, uh, create disincentives for private health insurance in the core, there will always be things that are covered by private health insurance, presumably on the periphery. And even that form of insurance can create problems. We see in our, uh, in our context, of course, much higher rates of administrative overhead in private insurance plans and the transfers of so-called bad risks, meaning sick people, from the private sector into the public sector because when they get sick, they fall back, and you know this phenomenon very well, they fall back into the safety net and so you end up with the very, um, the healthier and wealthier patients in the private se sector and the uh, unhealthy and the unwealthy in the public sector and all of the inequities that follow. <clears throat> 
And then the final consideration from layer three, where almost all of our private, uh, where almost all services are privately funded. Uh, these are things that, as Sarah said, may not be avoidable, but are certainly predictable, is to think a little bit about what happens at the interface. So we now have, for example, in a few large Canadian cities, a flourishing of, of boutique medicine practices in which people can come for so-called wellness visits and perfectly healthy individuals get subjected to a battery of stress tests and ultrasounds and mammograms at the age of 35 and you know, heaven knows what else and all kinds of things which are not covered by the public plan and therefore fair game for somebody to pay out of pocket for. And yet we know that this is bad medicine it is not just low value care, it's potentially harmful to the individuals who are getting it. And all of these tests then create referrals back into the public system for the incidental findings that result. And so you will never have a private pay section of the, of the health system that is, is totally uh, walled off. It's always a semi-permeable membrane in which people and problems and costs will you know, transfer back and forth. And thinking about what uh, regulatory um, uh, interventions are possible, not only at the level of government, but at the level of physician and other uh, clinical regulatory bodies um, and best practice guidelines, et cetera, is incredibly important as you think about how to navigate those intersections. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Okay, so thank you so much, um, Steph. Thank you, Jim, for the invitation. Um, really disappointed not being able to uh, be there in person with you today. Um, yeah, just to add insult to injury, my visa got ready uh, this afternoon, but at least they gave me a five-year visa, so I hope um, that next time I'll be able to join you in person. My name is Federico Guanais. Um, I am deputy head of the health division um, here at the OECD. And it's my pleasure to share with you a few um, experiences and a few ideas um, about um, um, private health insurance um, in OECD countries. Um, all right. So I think before we, we, we in the beginning, it, it's important to, to, sh um, to set out um, a little bit of, 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 the, of the terms and the context. Um, in, in the OECD countries, um, we do have um, some variation in the model, in the main source of basic health coverage. So, of course, when you're thinking about the context of the United States, it's very common for um, you all to think about um, uh, the insurance model, but that's not the case in, in, in every OECD country. So, we have first a, a first group of countries um, in which the main source of, of basic healthcare coverage is a residence based health system. So, that is just by being a resident, um, a citizen, or a resident, or a legal resident um, of the country, um, you are entitled to healthcare coverage. So that's the, all of the countries, for example, that have NHS-type uh, systems, national health systems, uh, UK, Australia, Canada, Spain, Portugal, Sweden, and many other countries as well. So, and then we have a second block of countries, uh, countries that we have what we call the health insurance system. And then within these layers, we have a few countries that have effectively a really a hardcore single payer. Um, that's the first block of countries that we have there. Then you have another layer of countries that have multiple insurers with automatic affiliation. Um, and then you have other countries in which you have multiple insurers um, with a choice of insurer. And these are the countries that are, are shown here, Chile, Czech Republic, Germany, Israel, the Netherlands, Slovak Republic, Switzerland, and the United States. However, there is something very different that, that really marks the American exceptionalism in this group, is that when we're talking about the Netherlands, Germany, Israel, you might have multiple insurers, but basically the, the, the insurance plan, the benefits that are covered are basically the same and are mandated for all insurance. It's not possible to price discriminate, it's not possible um, to deny coverage. So it's, it's fundamentally different. And I think even though we consider those to be uh, not single payer, but I understand when uh, in the context of the United States, you might, it's much, gonna be much closer to what a single payer uh, might be. So 
and here's something that you, you already know, and you've been talking a lot. In two thirds of, of OECD countries, all of the population has basic health coverage, which is often public. So, and, and, and here I think it's something that's, that's very important because if you look at the, um, the right side of this graph, you see where there's from Spain all the way to Australia, all of these countries have 100% um, of coverage of the population. So those are basically all of the high income OECD countries. And United States here is in the left side of the graph in the neighborhood of other middle income OECD countries, such as Mexico, Chile, um, or countries that are even in the accession um, process to the OECD, such as Costa Rica and Colombia. So the United States at 91% of the, of the coverage of the population is really something that the United States is away from its peers in the sense that it is the only country that does not cover 100% um, of its population amongst all of the high income countries. So this is definitely something uh, that gives us um, 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 food for thought and of course that motivates the whole discussion that you're having now. So um, here, um, I think it's important to point out that even in the countries that have 100% coverage and 100% public coverage, uh, there is a market for the private health insurance, which is often voluntary. And I think this is something that's already been extensively discussed um, previously by what Sarah um, mentioned and so on. But I'd like to call your attention to one point. Uh, there are some countries in which the private insurance may serve as the primary source of insurance. Of course, there's the case of the United States under the mandate of the Affordable Care Act, which um, I mean, it's been um, questioned. Um, so we, you could consider this as people who were covered within um, sort of a mandatory um, public um, uh, option of coverage. In the case of Germany and Chile, there is 10 to 20% of the population who opt out of the public system altogether and they're covered by the private insurance. So those are what we call the primary private health insurance. It's not really what you call the voluntary, but those people would be covered, um, manda it's, they're mandated to have a health insurance, but they opt out to not contribute to the public system and then they go to a separate private system. And then you have the voluntary private insurance that um, Sarah was mentioning, which I'm not going to go into the, the, even the explanation or the terminology because unfortunately we, have, we use different uh, names to each category. But in these countries, uh, people may opt to purchase additional cover for a number of reasons, which Sarah already explained. So in here, I think it's, it's, it's what I'd like to point out is that this voluntary private insurance may cover up to 95% of the population in OECD countries. You see the case of France, for example, that has 96% of the population that purchases additional private coverage, typically um, for, um, typically for, um, I'm sorry, um, the, the, um, typically for the, the issues um, of, of um, uh, covering additional co-payments. I'm starting to have a panic here because my computer is about to restart. So I hope it, 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 it allows me to go through the presentation, but let's see how it works. Um, so, um, and, and so coming back to the point that I was saying, um, so in, in o many OECD countries, a large percentage of, of the population have uh, voluntary private insurance. However, this, is really a small fraction of the expenses of the expenses, um, the health expenditures. So if you see here, I mean, there's a, a band here that you see where this is the voluntary health insurance, what I'm trying to point out here to you, um, is that in most OECD countries, the percentage of the health expenditures that are covered by this voluntary ex expenditure is very small. And in fact, the universal of comp compulsory schemes, they cover between 50 and 85% of health expenditures. So I think this is important to point out that the majority of the coverage comes from the universal and compulsory schemes. So something that Joe mentioned earlier, the voluntary will not get you there. So, and I think at another point, um, it's important to, to, um, uh, to, to highlight is that, um, the, 
what is covered by this voluntary um, um, private insurance or on the out-of-pocket private insurance. And I think this has important implications uh, to the design of the public system of the Medicare for all, if you will, that you're planning. So across the OECD, we see for all services, 27% of them are financed either by out-of-pocket expenditures or by voluntary expenditures. So this unfortunately does not show the United States, but it shows that about a quarter of all services are covered in, in across the OECD um, by this residual that's not covered by the public options. But if you look carefully, where is this mostly concentrated? This is mostly concentrated in dental care because typically, as it was the case of, of Canada. Um, so um, there's very often, it's not covered in, in the public systems. In some cases, 100% um, uh, of the dental care is actually covered either by out-of-pocket or by voluntary contributions um, and pharmaceuticals. So pharmaceuticals is also an area in which a lot of the expenditures across the OECD are financed by either out-of-pocket or voluntary insurance. So I think this is an important point because if you do not cover these areas, there are going to be a market for these or either people are going to pay for out-of-pocket or are going to have to buy a voluntary health insurance if it's allowed. So coming to the next slide, I think it's important to show that there are advantages and disadvantages of the different models. So if we take the case of Germany, in which people may opt out of the public system and go to a private system. So it happens that typically the people who do this are the ones who are better off. So the, the people who are um, healthier, wealthier, younger, because these are the people that the private markets will offer um, a lower rate and will try to lure them into coming uh, to this alternate system. So there is a proven adverse selection that the healthier private policyholders, they opt out of the public system and they, they reduce the pooling that's available um, for the, um, the, the public option. And there are waiting times that are shorter for the patients with private insurance because then there's the competition for limited resources within the health system. So that shows the kind of problems um, that may happen. It's important to point out that in Germany, this may only happen until you're 55. After you're 55, you can never go back to the, to the public system. So it happens that healthier people who suffer a health shock when they're young, they go back into the um, um, public system, but that may not ha uh, happen if they are older. In terms of the duplicate health insurance, those are the ones in the residence-based system. I mean, so people would uh, purchase additional insurance, uh, which is the case of Ireland, which is the case of UK and Australia. So the evidence shows that this may limit the access to healthcare services that are available to the patients with public insurance. And again, because of an issue uh, of competition for resources. So in the UK, we see evidence that um, in areas in which there is more higher waiting times, people tend to buy more private insurance. We don't know whether there is a causality, but there is a correlation. But then again, as Sarah um, and as Danielle pointed out, there might be problems also um, in effects in the duplicate um, um, cause on the public system. Now, um, going to the supplementary private insurance, I'm trying to avoid the label, sorry. So the supplementary private insurance is the insurance that you purchase to cover uncovered services. Um, Sarah has a different terminology for that. So because we're talking here about different basket of goods, um, in this case, um, there would be no perverse um, effects on the system a priority, right? So you're buying um, additional coverage for things that are not covered um, on the public system. However, um, this actually shows that there's, because there's no vertical redistribution and the possibility of, of risk selection, this can also influence the public markets as well. And in here, there is very, very aggressive uh, uh, cream skimming. And we see, for example, in the cases of Switzerland and the Netherlands, that very often the same um, insurers who are nonprofit in the mandatory statutory uh, markets, they are for profit 
in this additional supplementary private insurance where they go full-blown cream skimming, um, uh, uh, good risk selecting, and so on. And finally, um, for the type of insurance that covers co-payments, I mean, which is the case of, uh, the case of France that Tara was mentioned. It might help to control the growth of public spending, but this is at the cost of an increase in the amount of residuals that are covered by private insurance. So you're actually shifting further and further areas um, that will have to be covered by the private insurance. And in here, there are all the equity problems um, that um, um, Sarah mentioned before. So coming to my final thoughts, I think that, um, why are we talking about private health insurance if the, we're, the discussions about Medicaid, um, a Medicare for all, I'm sorry. So I think it's, it's, it's important to realize that the design of the public insurance will matter. So what's covered in public insurance will matter. And as much as we would like to cover everything in the public insurance, different uh, difficult choices are going to be, um, have to be made. And this will affect on whether there's a need um, for this additional um, um, private or voluntary market. So across the OECD countries, historically, the private insurance gradually evolved into a secondary role or a highly regulated role. So I think this is very important, even when private insurance exists, as the case of Germany, for example, pure private for the 10% who opt out of the system, this is highly regulated. But on the other hand, the private insurance market never disappeared from the OECD countries. And every now and then when there's discussion about budgets, there's renewed attention to it because, well, we're going to um, uh, spend more, there's predicted increase in demand, there's long-term care needs coming along the line. So there is a discussion that, that, that comes back and forth. And in there, there's a lot of discussion in terms of the political arbitrations between the desire to increase the pooling of risks outside of public budgets and to increase the financial sustainability of the healthcare supply. So many see this private health insurance market as a way to, well, let's take this away from out of pocket and let's pool risks, um, which would be a better um, option than just letting people um, go full blown um, out of pocket. However, we do know that there is an imp a strong impact on equity, as Sarah mentioned before, both from the funding and access per um, uh, perspectives, and also on the public care provision um, because of the competition for limited resources. So I hope this, this um, um, thoughts um, will, will contribute to the discussion and will bring the attention um, to the design issues that you're considering. Thank you very much. If you can hear me, it goes, oh, there we go. You're back. Uh, you've stopped chair. Good. So the floor is open. We have time for a few questions before lunch, please. So my name is Bill Bronson. I'm a physician. I'm sorry that I always have a question for something, but I'm, I'm loaded with issues. First of all, I just want to say in 50 years, the only time we've made great advances is when we've had a piece of legislation. When we talk to each other without a piece of legislation, it goes up in smoke. Everybody has an idea. Everybody has an opinion. So we have 1384, and I don't know if you have read it carefully. It is an extraordinary piece of legislation, and that should be our starting point for all discussion. In America, when so Bill, we- Super yes, short, yes, we have only a couple there. minutes in for questions. I'm gonna please. get there, I'm gonna, I promise I'm gonna get there. When we, in America, we are not going to copy or have anything limited like there is anywhere else in the world because we have enough money and the politics to make that change. That's, that's the base, okay? So here's my question. One of the choke points is the lack of adequate personnel. What kind of subsidies are being provided worldwide or whatever to double or triple the number of, of professionals we have, not just doctors, but all the intermediary staff and dentists, that's number one. Number two, I'm interested in the people owning the medical system. Up to now, the medical system is another land in our land that question, is owned question. by them. There are there models or examples of where there are people, public, genuine ownership of the whole system so that it can't strike out when they are when, when the system is pressed for change? Do you understand okay. that question? Y yep, Dr. very good. Dr. Struck in well. Saskatchewan because they own the system. We don't own our medical care system. It's owned by the corporations. How do we make that shift? 
Okay, what I'm going to do is to take two more questions and then have a quick round of responses because then we'll be out of time. I, as I said, I'm going to take three questions and then have some joint answers. Please. Hi, I'm Dr. Tomasiewicz. I'm a physician in Marin County. And I have a question specifically for... That's fine. It's, it's on. Just close yeah, to your mouth and speak for, up. For Dr. Martin. Uh, in, in the U.S., the cost of medical education is prohibitive. And it makes a, a, a system that is uh, very restrictive on compensation to physicians uh, very difficult. Uh, do you have the same issue with the high cost of medical care? Do you subsidize uh, medical education to a greater degree than we do here in the U.S.? Very good. Another question in the back there. Hi, Miranda Dietz from the UC Berkeley Labor Center. In a country like Germany, where there are different insurance providers, what's the role of those insurance providers? What do they do and what value are they bringing? Okay, and I'll take one more right here. <laughs> no, but we need a microphone, otherwise Federico can't, can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious, is your recommendation no private insurance? Have you seen the detriment and sort of the erosion? You're saying it should all be public or you think the regulation of private is enough? Okay, very good. Um, Federico, I'm going to let all of you um, take a whack at it, but let me start with you just in case we have a technical problem and we can work on that when they're talking. So why don't you start? Okay, yeah, that, that's wise. Um, so about the question of ownership, I think probably um, the system that 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 uh, is closer um, to what to what um, um, uh, uh, the question refers to is the NHS is the, is the British um, um, NHS National Health System. It's um, so where where uh, really um, in, in, and even in terms of you you look at the the, the pride that the that the British people have in it. So I mean I I'm. I think I think Sarah should speak uh, more to that um, uh, than I do, but but I w I would say that will probably be the closest thing to 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 what your question, sir. Um, in terms, of, I'll also take a shot at the cost of medical education, which I think is a very relevant point, because this is also a point in the OECD countries. The cost of medical education is really neglectable compared to what it is in the United States, or it's free. Um, so. Actually, um, you might go into into medicine um, for 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 and, and don't do not have to pay for for the cost of your med medical education because it's public subsidized. And I think this is an important point that really really um, should also be considered and should, should also be discussion in terms of the provision um, of the health workforce. Um, in terms of what what what, what in Germany, um, what do they do? What what the value? Um, that they add. So I think that that in in the German uh, model, I I would say that th they are inspired by the things that are happening um, in the United States as well. I mean, some of the interesting developments, which there are positive experiences um, coming out um, from the United States in the area of affordable care uh, from from the accountable care organizations and so on. But I would say that the market's more heavily regulated um, so they add much fewer value um, because there's much less room for innovation um, so i would be pressed to to give you a, um, an answer uh, to the question which really what's what's the value um, that's that that's being given by the the private providers in germany but i'm not saying i'm not recommended that there be no private insurance what i'm saying basically is that um, in in the in the markets in which there are private insurance, like in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Israel, um, the role of the private insurers is heavily regulated. So so that's absolutely something that that I think that that's the experience um, from the OECD countries, and that's something that should be considered for discussion in the United States. I'll stop here. I've, yeah, there we are. Good. Um, so since continuing in reverse order, Danielle, do you want to take a, a next shot? Sure. So uh, first on the cost of medical education. So the cost of a medical education or a health professional's education in general in Canada is high. It is not as high as it is in the U.S. 
But, uh, you know, I graduated from medical school in 2003 and I had a $180,000 Canadian debt. Um, and, 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 uh, and that was, you know, a number of years ago. Uh, it is, it is common for people to graduate medical school with debts of that, um, at that level. And, um, I will say that, um, unlike many of the European countries that you've heard referenced today, physician incomes are also very high. In fact, I had a slide on comparative physician incomes in my presentation originally, and I took it out. I should have left it in. Um, Canadian doctors make very good money. Again, not quite as much money as American doctors, uh, although in some specialties, we earn more. Um, and uh, most of those uh, incomes are, are publicly disclosed. You can look them up. There's a thing called the Blue Book in British Columbia. There's a whole expose in the Toronto Star about Ontario physician incomes. All the data is fraught. It doesn't include overhead. It only includes billings, et cetera, et cetera. There's a million complaints about it, but it will give you a sense of what a Canadian doctor earns. And very often it is as much, and in some cases more, in some cases less um, than, uh, than American physicians, because we are in a common market with you for our professionals. We cannot afford to pay our doctors half of what your doctors earn or they would all come south of the border. One of the reasons that they don't do so and they don't do so is because they are very well paid in Canada. The second question is with respect to what do I think the role of private insurance should be? If you truly want an equitable healthcare system, you should not have private insurance that duplicates what is covered in your plan, period. No duplicative insurance, period. Should you allow private insurance, for, and as we've seen, you should not have co-payments and you should not have deductibles, so you should not need insurance to cover those things, so you shouldn't have them. I think, I mean, that is, you know, that is how you, you structure a just healthcare system. Should you have insurance that covers those things that are not covered by the public plan? Yes, of course you should, and you shouldn't cover everything for everyone all the time. You should cover things that have evidence that they actually improve health, which is the purpose of a healthcare system, which means you can't cover all of it. And so for those things that should not be covered on the basis of solid medical evidence or because there is a limit to the public resource pool and not everything is cost effective and you're going to have hard social conversations like the rest of us, welcome to the club about what should be covered and what shouldn't, you're going to get into those difficult conversations and you're going to need to have some ways for people to purchase those things that are not covered. And, and so when you do that, then pay attention to the interactions is all I was trying to say, because nothing ever exists, you know, completely separate from the public system. When you have a strong and big and vibrant public system, what you allow people to pay for privately at the margins will have unintended ripple effects back. Thank you, Danielle. And to close us out, Sarah. <laughs> I'm just going to respond to the question about Germany. So the question was, do, this, do the health insurance funds in Germany add value? And I think we have to distinguish here between the public bit of the system and the private bit of the system. The publicly financed system is run by health insurance funds called sickness funds. And when these were established over 150, 200 years ago, they were um, formed at very local level, so really representing local interests. They, were, they had representatives on the board of patients, of government, local government, of employees and employers, because all of these stakeholders had some skin in the game. So they were really providing a very local function, and that's the function that they fulfill today. When it comes to the, the private health insurance uh, system, I think it is more questionable about the value that they add there. And this, this combination of public and private health insurance in Germany is really detrimental to the overall performance of the health system because it creates very blurred boundaries um, and un, un, un inequalities in access. But the reason why Germany still has this dual system of public and private and why it still has this system of multiple insurers is because of history and path dependency and the difficulty of really shifting from one having a radical shift from one system to another. Um, so my, I think the lesson for the US in that is when you do manage to reform your system, make sure you get it right from the beginning, at least in terms of, of the fundamentals.